comets. Comets are probably some of the most beautiful sights in our solar system. A comet is made up of a frozen icy nucleus only about a dozen kilometers long. So it starts out in the outer solar system as a very small, tiny, icy nucleus, rock, and then it has some ice, water ice, and, and different kinds of ices around it. Surrounding this nucleus is the coma, which is about a thousand times larger than the nucleus. Okay, And then as the comet starts coming towards the sun, this nucleus starts heating up and then forms a tail. The coma is a vast cloud of gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, sulfur, and carbon. And it is about seven times the diameter of the Earth. Okay? Huge. Very, very big. So it's got a lot of different things in there. And the more we analyze the comets, the more we can kind of find out what's in there because a comet is a good indication to us what the solar system looked like in the beginning of the formation of the solar system. What did the universe look like? What did the solar system look like? Okay, so as the comet approaches the sun, the tail grows in size. It starts forming a tail and can extend up to one AUs in length. Imagine that, one AUs, the distance from the earth to the sun, that's a huge length. There are actually two kinds of tails. The gas or ionic tail, that's just the same, different words for the same term. You can either call it a gas tail or ion tail. And is, this is called a type 1 tail. Dust tail is called type 2. That's the other kind of tail, dust tail. The ionic tail is very, very long, okay, and thin, and always points away from the sun. So remember, ionic tail is the same thing as saying gas tail. Um, so think of it as very, very long, thin, and it always points away from the sun because the sun's solar wind interacts with the ionic tail and pushes it away from the sun, okay? So the gas tail or the ionic tail interacts with the sun's solar wind. The solar wind particles come, push it away, and they always directly are pointing away from the sun. The dust tail is made up of small dust particles, which is why its spectrum is similar to the sun's because it reflects sunlight in our direction. So when we look at the spectra of the dust tail, the sun's sunlight uh, reflects off of it, and its spectra looks like the spectrum of the sun. The dust tail does not always point away from the sun. Okay? It's the gas tail that points away, not the dust tail. Okay, we can see it here. You see the comet is beginning here. Nuclear swarms, gas begins to evaporate. You see the nucleus is coming. Gas coma forms around the nucleus when comet is about three AUs from the sun. So when the comet is coming, right around three AUs, and then this is the sun right here, three AUs, it starts getting really hot. The coma starts growing, okay? Starts growing. As it, as it comes closer, you see the tail starting to form? The, the, the sunlight, the, the solar energy is pushing it. The tail forms pushed out by solar wind and radiation pressure. Distance is now about 1 AU, the distance from the comet to the sun. Okay? And this arrow that they drew is the solar wind. And then this one that they're drawing is solar radiation. You see, so the solar wind is pushing it away like that. When the comet is getting even closer, and then you see here the gas tail now is very, very long. And then this is the dust tail, you see. So the dust tail trails behind it, you know, kind of like a, a, sp a water sprinkler that's rotating. You know, those automatic water sprinklers, they rotate. As the thing is rotating, what does the path of the water look like? Kind of like this, it follows, right? So if it's rotating this way, the water is going to look like that, right? Splashing from the the sprinkler. It's going to look curved. So it's like that. You see that? That curvature. So then you go like this. By the time the comet gets here, you see the ionic tail. Tail points away from the sun. And then this is the dust tail. Tail now points ahead of the comet's motion. You see now that it's here and the sun pressure is pushing on it. So this is the tail. And then if they drew the dust tail, probably look like that. 
and then by the time it's getting farther away, solar heating diminishes, coma and the tail disappear eventually by the time it gets here, you see? By the time it's four to six AUs away, the coma has already disappeared. So when can we best see it? When it's close to the sun, you know, when the tail is big. Uh, remember we talked about meteor showers the other day, when do meteor showers happen? So if the Earth's orbit is like this, imagine, you see? So when the Earth comes, you see this is the dust tail? When let's say the Earth's orbit is like this, and let's say Earth happens to be here when the comet is coming, you see? You see all this dust? That's going to cause a meteor shower, you see? So the Earth's orbit, if they drew it here, it would look maybe something like this. Like that, you see? So there's going to come a point where the Earth is either going to be here or here, and then this dust is going to fall to the Earth, and then that's going to cause a meteor shower, okay? Most comets can only survive about 100 to 1,000 orbits around the sun. That means they're not going to go around forever. There's going to come a time and limit. They're going to either burn out or they're going to just go the, away from the solar system. Eventually, the sun will melt away its ices and reduce it down to just dust particle because all this heating is happening constantly, right? Therefore, there must be a fresh supply of comets coming from someplace. Okay, so since they, they have a particular lifetime, they're not going to last forever. They're going to burn out after 100 to 1,000 runs. So th the fact that we continually have new fresh supply of comets coming makes us think, where is this coming from? There must be a new supply every constantly giving us comets. That's why Gerard Kuiper um, came up with the theory that there must be a belt outside of the orbit of Neptune, and this became known as the Kuiper Belt. He theorized that the comets must be coming from there. And then uh, Jan Oort, another scientist, said there's another belt much, much farther away outside of the Kuiper Belt known as the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud must be the supply of long period comets, the ones that take longer. Okay. Since they theorized this, we've actually discovered many Kuiper Belt objects outside of the orbit of Neptune. The most famous of the Kuiper Belt objects is what? Starts with P. Pluto, our ninth planet that we used to think, is now unofficially a Kuiper Belt object, you see? So the Kuiper Belt extends beyond the orbit of Neptune, and Pluto is one of those members from 30 AUs away all the way out to 100 AU. The Oort cloud, on the other hand, is a spherical cloud of these icy bodies some 10 to 100,000 AUs away, many, many thousands of AUs away. The comets that come from the Kuiper belt are short period comets. They come very frequently, I mean, relatively speaking. They only, last, uh, they only take 200 years to come back, make a full trip. 200 years is not that long, which have orbits less than 30 degrees from the ecliptical plane. So that means if the Earth's orbit is like this, the Kuiper Belt comets are kind of close to the ecliptical plane, like this or like that, within 30 degrees of the ecliptical plane. Uh, what's the most famous Kuiper Belt comet coming from the Kuiper Belt? Starts with H. And then A, Halley's Comet. It comes around every how many years? It was in one of the previous uh, notes. 76, yeah, 76 years. So it's less than 200 years, right? Every 76 years. Comet Halley, well, there it was right there is an example of these comets whose orbital period is 76 years. A hundred of the 600 well-documented comets are short-period comets, short-period comets which come from the Kuiper belt. And they revolve around the sun in the same direction that the planets do counterclockwise. By when we say counterclockwise, we're looking at it from the north. All the planets revolve around the sun counterclockwise, and the Kuiper belt comets also 
go counterclockwise like that, okay? So that's a couple things we've learned so far. Their plane of orbit is close to the Earth's within 30 degrees. Their or direction is also same direction as the Earth's, okay? In contrast, the Oort cloud comets are long period comets, okay? With arbitrarily inclined orbits. That means they could be coming like this, instead of like that, you see? They could be coming from up here, go back up, okay? They could be coming like that. And their direction of orbit could either be clockwise or counterclockwise, no particular order, okay? So it says, it says here, arbitrarily inclined orbits and either clockwise or counterclockwise orbits. Most astronomers now believe that Pluto, Charon, and even Triton, which is the largest moon of Neptune, and other moons in the outer solar system are icy planetesimals in the Kuiper belt, which were captured by the planet Neptune. Okay, Neptune captured um, uh, Triton. It probably even tried to capture Pluto, but wasn't able to, you know. Pluto got away, so, and then it became its own uh, Kuiper Belt object. The Oort cloud, on the other hand, is believed to have been formed when the outer giant planets ejected the icy particles of the outer solar system. So this is kind of an interesting theory. We think that the Oort cloud may not have been there at the beginning. It was just free of particles, but then these giant planets like Neptune, Uranus, took these little icy particles that were in the outer solar system and they flung them out. They flung them out to the Oort cloud. So they weren't originally there. And then every once in a while, something makes them, perturbs their orbit and they come towards the sun. And then they, their orbit lasts more than 200 years. They are long period comets. Okay, so this gives us a visual. Uh, you see here, this is the Kuiper belt. You see how the Kuiper belt is more or less the same orbit as the Earth's. And the comets that come from there go this way. Okay, but the Oort cloud is spherical. The comets that come from there, they come this way. So it says Oort cloud, a swarm of trillions of comet nuclei in a huge shell surrounding the sun and planets. The distance from here to here, approximately 100,000 AU. The distance from here to the inner Oort cloud, 40,000 AU. So that's still a lot, 40 to all the way to 100,000, okay? Uh, by the way, where's our closest star in this picture? Is our closest star here, here, or is it outside? Back, all the way back in lecture one, we learned that our closest star is how many light years away? We've forgotten it already. Four light years away, right? Each light year, is 63,000 AUs, okay? So 63,000 times four, roughly 240,000 or 250,000 AU, okay? So our closest star is about 250,000 AUs away from the Earth. Where would that bring that? If the distance from here to here is 100,000 AU, 250,000 AU would make it somewhere here. This is our closest star, you see? So that gives you a visual. Our closest star is here, and other stars are all the way here, you see. So the Milky Way galaxy in this picture doesn't even fit. It's huge, okay? So this is only showing you our background before you even get to our closest star. Comet collisions are a frequent event in our solar system. Jupiter absorbs many of these collisions that would otherwise be headed towards the Earth. So if Jupiter had not been there, we would have seen a lot more comets coming our way, okay? In 1994, we actually got to see this happening. A comet was headed towards the inner solar system, but Jupiter absorbed it. It became very famous. It became all in the news. Um, many astronomers recorded this collision and the name of this comet became known as Shoemaker-Levy, named after the two scientists who saw it uh, colliding and who uh, observed it, and many, many other scientists followed along and they observed it also. Shoemaker-Levy 9. 
it smashed into Jupiter and broke into 21 pieces, okay, in 1994. We actually got to see this comet coming to Jupiter, and the gravity of Jupiter split it into 21 pieces, crashed there. A lot of scientists believe that a big Jupiter-like planet is necessary to protect life in our planet. So if it wasn't for Jupiter, it's possible life would not have formed on Earth. Why? A lot more collisions would have happened. It would have been a lot more dangerous. So if we go hunting for extrasolar planets in other uh, solar systems, and if we want to know whether they harbor life, what are we going to look for? We're going to look for a star that is similar to the sun, that lives for a long time. We're going to look for a Jupiter-like planet which can protect the life. And then maybe inside of that Jupiter-like planet, an Earth-like planet, which is like Earth, okay? Those are most likely to have life in them, you see. Some famous craters are the Behringer Meteorite Crater in Flagstaff, Arizona. If you ever get a chance to go see that one, it's really, really big, huge. There's a museum there too. Uh, and the other one is the Chicxulub Chik, Crater in the northern Yucatan Valley. Um, that one is also very, very famous. The Arizona Crater is believed to be caused by an iron meteorite some 90 meters in diameter. And it fell about 50,000 years ago, roughly, into Arizona. Okay. However, the other one, the Chicxulub crater, is believed to be caused by a bigger crater, okay, bigger meteorite fell in the northern Yucatan region of Mexico, okay. Uh, that's where the, I believe, the Mayan culture lived, where the Mayans uh, lived in um, uh, where Cancun is, kind of in that area, okay. Um, some 65 million years ago. So much, much longer, much, much before than this one. This is 50,000 years ago. This is 65 million years ago. And this one is the one that we believed ended the dinosaur age. It killed the dinosaurs and it ended the Cretaceous period. Why? Because it, it was such a big collision that it, um, all this dust filled the air, uh, covered the sunshine, it became very poisonous, and for many, many, many years after that, it just life became unbearable, so the dinosaurs died off from that collision. Okay, good. So that is the solar system review.